we'll also spend a fair amount of time on demos. Let me hide the little control panel here. Uh, all right. So the um, first thing I want to start with is just a, a broad overview of what RIA Services is. This is the first of a series of webinars we'll do on this topic, focusing on different aspects of RIA Services as we go through. And this uh, series will, of webinars will somewhat parallel a uh, article series that I did on the Silverlight Show portal site that you can find a link to at the end of the slides here. Uh, I will also follow up with a blog post on my blog, which is briannoise.net, and you can uh, find the slides and the demos there uh, after the fact. So what is RIA Services? Uh, RIA Services is really sort of a mini framework that's part of the .NET framework on the server side and the Silverlight framework on the client side that makes it really easy to get data to your Silverlight application. A lot of developers moving into Silverlight may not have been used to building multi-tier service-based applications and diving into the whole arena of WCF on its own is kind of a, a deep pool to try and figure out, you know, WCF on its own is capable of a whole ton of different scenarios. But for a lot of Silverlight apps, you really just need to get some data to and from the application to a back-end service. And so RIA services is really targeted at making that as easy as possible. So it basically simplifies the process of building into your Silverlight apps and it tries to hide all the plumbing that sits in between your presentation layer and your data access layer on the server side uh, and, and make it as transparent as possible that there is a whole you know, service layer in between and, and a pipe in between going across the web uh, to your back end and, and getting that data to you. So it is really focused on line of business apps that are, do a lot of CRUD type manipulation of data. Um, and it's really a set of tools and frameworks and functionality that helps you build your client out. So one of the biggest questions I get asked a lot is, you know, why would I bother with WCF RIA services? What does it do for me? And as I just mentioned, one of the first benefits is just the fact that it gets rid of a lot of raw plumbing code that you would normally have to write in terms of defining explicit WCF services, to, to deciding what the service contracts look like, uh, declaring those services, implementing them, setting up a host environment for them, configuring that host, setting up a client proxy. You know, these are all normal things you have to do just to get connectivity from a client to a service. And all that kind of happens automatically for you with WCF RIA services. It's really sort of a, a pre-defined data pipeline uh, via services, and it happens to be WCF services, but you don't really have to know WCF to do RIA services. Um, under the covers, it is, you know, also helping you out in the fact that it really lays down a prescriptive architecture. So part of the challenge in, in moving into Silverlight for some people is the fact that, you know, they really don't know where to start, of where does, what kind of code go, and where should I be calling the service, and what should I put in the service, and all that kind of stuff. This just sets up and, and lets you focus on the functionality you want to expo expose from the server side and that then having client side equivalents of that server functionality just right there for you on the client side. Um, and like I said, it really hides the complexities of WCF for you. One of the other benefits is it, it extends the link programming model. And what I really mean by that, we'll talk a little bit about deferred execution. It lets you use the link syntax, either the expression language or just the link methods such as where's and selects and order buys and things like that. I'll let you use those in the Silverlight client to query the data that's really on the back end. And there's a lot of efficiency to that, not only just the syntax of it, which is becoming more and more familiar to people, but it uh, actually causes the expression that you indicate in the client code, it causes it to execute on the server side. And if you're using a link provider like Entity Framework, it actually executes all the way at the database. So it's very efficient in terms of not pulling any more data out of the database than necessary. And even, even if you do pull more out of the database than necessary, you don't transmit it across the wire to the client unless you really need it. Um, there's also a lot of great client-side framework that you sort of inherit from RIA services. Some of it is co-generated specific to your context, such as the entities that you're working with, and we'll see that in the demo. Um, but also those entities derive from some base classes and things that are really form a, a client-side framework for making the service calls, doing the querying, updating, validating, security, and a lot of other aspects I'll be talking about throughout this series. <clears throat> 
All right, so what do you need to get started? Basically, if you've got Silverlight uh, development tools on your box, you've already got what you need. The uh, RIA services ships with the Silverlight tools for Visual Studio 2010 is its installation mode from a, a developer perspective. And it's really got just some uh, lightweight installs from the, uh, from the server side perspective that you would install uh, on a production box. And um, on the client box, it would just get carried along as additional class libraries in your deployed Zap. Uh, that goes along with your Silverlight application. There are some additional bits that are available. Uh, there's a RIA services toolkit that adds on some functionality to add additional endpoints, SOAP and JSON REST style endpoints that expose your RIA services functionality to other clients. Uh, I cover that in part 10 of my article series on uh, the Silverlight show and, and I'll probably be touching on it in a later web webinar. Also a thing to be aware of that's out there right now in beta format is there is a service pack one that's coming for RIA services and it provides some uh, new functionality and, and some improved functionality in that you can now support complex types, meaning if you have a, a, something like an address with a street object with a, with a number object inside of that, in the current release those things get flattened out. Uh, in service pack one you'll be able to support those multi-layer complex types uh, owned by a parent entity type and also sharing entities across domain services and a number of other improvements I won't, won't go into detail on here. But uh, if you're willing to play around with beta stuff, I would definitely check that out and pull it down. If you want to stick to production, it won't be very long until that's out. They don't have any specific dates for that yet, uh, but I wouldn't ex expect it to be more than, uh, more than some number of months from now. Basically what you do when you're working with various services is you define a normal Silverlight application and you set up a linkage between the client project and the server project. And that linkage is really just a pointer under the covers. It's really a relative path to the server project so that the uh, Visual Studio environment can do some code generation in your client side project to give you the code you need to call your services. So you basically focus on the server side. You define your entities and your domain service is the base class that you derive from that is your real service functionality you're exposing in the form of CRUD type operations. You compile and Visual Studio, the tools in Visual Studio will generate some client side code that they collectively call proxy code. It's not exactly the same thing as a WCF proxy. It's not just a specific class that makes the call. It's really the aggregate of a number of different classes that are generated on the client side that make it really easy to call that server side functionality. The entities that you work with can really be any type. Uh, if you want to use the most productive, easy to use, you know, sort of out of the box way of using in, uh, RIA services, you'll use Entity Framework and the entities that you pass will basically be client side versions of the Entity Framework entities that get declared as part of your model. Uh, but just like Entity Framework now supports plain old CLR objects or POCOs as people call them. Uh, domain services, or I'm sorry, RIA services with their domain services support POCOs as well, uh, meaning you can have just any old class with properties exposed on it that gets serialized across the, the wire and you can consume it in your Silverlight client with RIA services. But you'll just have to follow a few conventions, some attributes primarily that you have to put on your, uh, some sort of key property to uniquely discriminate each object, and if you have associated entity types, there's some, uh, there's some attributes you put to indicate those. Um, along with your entity types, there are these things called metadata classes, often called buddy classes. And I'll just uh, wait till we get in the demo to show you what these are really all about. But they're a way of basically adding information to your entity types if your entity types themselves cannot be directly modified, which is the case with entity framework generated entities. All right, um, I'm just going to jump right into a demo here shortly. but. Basically what we'll step through is the ability to query an update is the title of the, uh, the, the webinar here indicated. And so the, the first thing to point out here in terms of query operations is on your domain service, the thing you define on the server side, you have to expose methods that are going to be called to query your data. And those methods can either return a single object, an ienumerable, or an iQueryable. Um, and I'll just talk through most of this in the context of the demo, and then I'll just jump back to the slides to make sure I didn't miss any key points. So with that, I'm going to jump over to Visual Studio, and we'll first quickly do kind of your, your uh, WCF Area Services 101 type app, and we'll see one way to query data in the context of that. Um, so I'll just call this uh, WCF Area 101, and I'll pop that out to my desktop. And uh, 
basically what we're going to do here, you'll see I'm just creating a normal Silverlight application. There is this separate project template called the Silverlight Business App that is uh, specific to WCF Area Services. That's sort of like uh, the difference if you play around with ASP.NET, the difference between an empty ASP.NET web project versus a ASP.NET web project. The ASP.NET one, they pre-populate with a page that has some styles and the login and the membership and security all hooked up. The Silverlight Business App is the, the client-side equivalent to that for Silverlight. So from a learning perspective, it's easier to start with a blank slate and just use an empty uh, Silverlight project here. When I say OK, the standard thing in Silverlight is that you'll get this dialog which asks you whether you want a hosting website. Normally, if you're just focusing on the client side in the Silverlight project, you might uncheck the box here and not have one. But you can see down at the bottom here, an important aspect of this is this checkbox that says Enable WCF REA Services. And this is really the thing that sets up that linkage I mentioned in the slides between the client side project and the server side project that's going to host it that will expose your server domain services. So you want to check that box and say OK. At this point, I still just have basically an empty, WC, or a empty Silverlight project with its host project all set up to uh, expose that Silverlight app. But the one thing that was added here, if you go into your Silverlight client-side project properties, and I'll just expand my view here, down at the bottom of the Silverlight properties, you can see uh, I'm getting a little prompt here about experiencing network difficulties. Hopefully, people are still hearing me here. Let me pause just one second. And email, could you just, if you're hearing me okay, could you just pop a message in my chat window to confirm? Uh, yeah, Brian is telling me okay. Okay. I'm getting a prompt here telling me I have network difficulties. All right. Sorry for that interruption, folks. Um, so back where I was is down here at the bottom of the Silverlight properties. You can see this WCF REA services link. And you can drop it down and point to other projects besides your host one. There are some limitations in the tool here. But all that thing amounts to, as I mentioned, is really inside your CSPROJ or VBPROJ project file, there's a relative path to the server project where it expects your REA services uh, to live. Okay. Um, so basically what I'm going to do next here is let me open up Solution Explorer here. And if we go in and the start of things is you really need some data to work with. So I'll just quickly create a new, um, just give me a sec here. I'm just trying to rearrange some windows and hide the control panel here. There we go. All right. So what I'm going to do is add an ADO.NET and a data model. To make this uh, simple and familiar to everyone as a starting point, I'll use the uh, Northwind database that everyone's probably bored to death with, but at least you know what's in there. And I'll say add here, generate a model from the database, and just select, uh, for now I'll do, let's do products and suppliers. So I'll do products and suppliers here, and click finish. And build is an important step here if you're playing around with RIA services because the next step I'm about to do basically causes Visual Studio to reflect on your server project. And if you don't build first, it's not going to see this entity model we just created. As I mentioned, you're not stuck to entity framework. You could use any form of data access you want. It just requires a little bit more work in defining your domain service. So the next step that is specific to uh, WCF REA services is in the web category to go ahead and select a domain service class as a template. And we'll just call this our uh, products domain service. And I can check the boxes here. Basically this dialog that's up on the screen right now is a one-time code generation on the server side. Once you dismiss this dialog, you can't really get back to it for your domain service that's generated. So you want to think carefully about which boxes to check while you're in here. It doesn't produce an immense amount of code, so it's not that hard to compensate for forgetting something in here. But it's just easier to let the dialog do the work for you. So I'll just say I want to work with products and their suppliers in the uh, domain service that I'm defining. Checking these edit boxes over here on the right makes it generate the insert, update, and delete methods you'll need for editing. And better to do that and strip them out than to have to come up with them on your own if you don't use them. And the box at the bottom is uh, about this metadata that I mentioned in the slides that we'll see what that's for. But it's basically to supplement the types that are generated for your entity framework model 
uh, being able to tack on additional information to their properties through something called a metadata class. So I'll click OK there, and that's doing, like I said, some code generation. It added a few additional references to my server-side project here. You can see these service model .domain service namespaces here. Uh, that's basically all the RIA service libraries on the server side. And in the code here, you can see it defined really two CS files, a products domain service and a metadata uh, class associated with that. So we'll just focus on the domain service itself for now. And you can see that this class derives from a base class provided by RIA services. This one knows about any framework and it knows about the query patterns and update patterns of, of any framework. So it makes it a little bit easier to work with your any framework models. Um, if you're working with some other data source, then you would just derive from a, a base class of that, which is called just domain service. And then you would have different query patterns inside the methods I'm about to show. As I mentioned, RIA services is really all focused on CRUD type operations, create, read, update, delete. And so all the methods that you'll see generated here, you start with a query method that gets your data to the client. Once it gets to the client, RIA services supports uh, basically caching that data on the client side after it's been retrieved, letting you make changes to that data, and then sending it back for update purposes on the server side. So your query method here looks like, if you're familiar with any framework, this object context is an entity framework instance for, you can see the generic type up at the top is the Northwind Entities class. And it's just saying I'm going to expose the whole products collection here. Now if you're used to thinking in terms of normal uh, business layer or normal WCF service type classes, you might look at this and go, okay, well now I'm going to have to add a bunch of other query methods like get products by customer ID and get products by date and things like that. The beauty here is with this iQueryable return type, that is just an expression tree basically. And what happens is the client can provide its own expression tree that says I want to get products where their product name is this and their price is this and whatever kind of query criteria they want to, want to put together with a link statement. That expression tree actually gets sent down to the server side here. And when it executes this method, the get products method, it's actually just returning a server side expression tree up into the RIA services stack. And basically the RIA service stack will merge those two expression trees, execute it, and that causes the uh, set of, of products that actually get returned to the client. So you did, the, the benefit of that, just from a productivity perspective, is you don't have to think about all the different ways that your client wants to query your service. You just have to decide what collections are you willing to expose from the service and leave it up to the client from there. And they can basically push down whatever uh, expression trees they want to filter this list of products. Now obviously you might want to have some server side control over that. So you can certainly you know, put on whatever kinds of uh, things you want to do here. So I could do a little link expression to say I want to uh, order these by their product name perhaps. And so that would be the expression tree or part of the expression tree that's returned by the server side and merged with the client one. Uh, you can also do things to, you can do a take operation, for example, to limit the number of rows that are returned. There's also an attribute that you can put on these query methods, not surprisingly called query. And on that query attribute, it has a property for result limit where I could specify a result limit of say 100 rows if I want to make sure that clients don't ask for too many rows at one time. So these are all things where you do have server-side control of who gets to see what. And in fact, inside of this method, you could do role-based authentication, which I'll get to in a later, uh, later webinar, where you could filter the rows that are returned based on the, the caller's role or things like that. So that's what a query method looks like. And generally, you don't need more than one query method per entity type in a domain service uh, unless you're specifically trying to limit access to different parts of the overall collections. Now, because I checked the box for both products and suppliers, I did actually get a separate get suppliers method down here. Um, there's also patterns where you might treat, in some scenarios, you might have parent and child relationships, and you don't want to return the children independent of the parent. Uh, you can also accommodate that fairly easily in RIA services. The other methods that's defined here are the insert, update, and delete methods, and we'll get to those uh, shortly in terms of the update side of things. But let's just focus on the query side for now. So once we have the uh, domain service with, with at a minimum one query method defined in it, if I go ahead and build here, I'll build my solution. 
And what's happening at this point is it's doing some code generation in the client-side project. Now, it doesn't become apparent when you just stare at that project because nothing seems to have changed there. Uh, but if you expand the, the references, you'll see that on the client side as well, there's some service model domain services uh, libraries that have been added. And the other thing you can do is say show all files, and you'll see there's a generated code folder that's created uh, with a .g.cs generated file. And this is where all those classes, I mentioned that a bunch of classes get code generated on the client side. This is where those show up. So here I'm dropping down the type dialog at the top to show you the classes that have been code generated in this file. And you can see that there's one for each entity type uh, for each domain service in the project that you're linked to. So here I have product and supplier entity types. I've also got the important class that you focus on most with RIA services on the client side is this thing called a domain context. So the, the easiest way to think about it is think of the domain context as the client side equivalent or client side access to your server side domain service. And it will follow a naming convention where if it was products domain service, it'll be products domain context on the client side. So basically then you have to be able to use these queries on the client side. Now the easiest and most productive way and demo's great way uh, to use this is to just simply open up a UI, a user control uh, that you want to put some, some of this data into and present it to the user. And then use the data sources window in, uh, in Visual Studio. And you can see after a moment there your entities pop in. That's be part, because part of that code generation also makes sure that the data sources window is aware of these entity definitions on the, on the client side. So if I wanted to display uh, just my products, for example, in the data grid, I could just drag and drop. And if you're familiar with this data sources window, it was around in Windows Forms 2.0. In fact, I wrote, wrote a book on data binding in Windows Forms 2.0 that talked a lot about it. Unfortunately, we didn't have it for a while in WPF or Silverlight, but now in 2010, it's, it's back and available to us. And uh, I'm just going to do a reset layout all here on the grid it created. We won't worry, worry a whole lot about layout. But in that drag drop, it did a little bit of magic for us. Um, the first thing it did, if we look at the XAML, is it did declare this data grid. Uh, it figured out what columns to present there based on the properties of the entity that I'm working with. That's just st standard data source window stuff. But the other thing it did is it declared this object called a domain data source. And this is something that RIA Services has created to be able to actually go and call via your domain context object, which you can see an instance of is declared as a child of this domain data source. It basically creates an instance of that domain context, uses it to call the server side uh, domain service, and execute a query to pull down uh, your objects. You can see up above in the property query name here, it's pointing to a method on the domain context called get products query. So for each query method you have on the server side, remember the one on the server side was just called get products, there's a corresponding client side query uh, method. And that thing returns an expression tree, a query object, that you can then do link expressions on, such as where and take and order by and so on. Uh, and pass that to the domain context to have it load the data based on that expression. In this case, it's just calling the whole get products method, and so it'll take whatever the server offers up. But this domain data source is a very flexible thing. The only thing I don't like about it, and I'll touch a little bit at the end, is I focus a lot on the model VV model pattern. And uh, when you focus on MVVM, uh, the idea is to have your views be fairly stupid about getting things done. They leave it up to their view model to get them the data that they work with. And so this puts a little bit too much smarts into the XAML, in my opinion. So usually I'll, uh, I'll end up stripping this out. I'll show an example in a bit here that's more model view, view model style. Um, but if you're not focused on the MVVM pattern, then this domain data source can definitely come in handy for just sucking the data in and making it easy to present. And so with that, uh, that code in place, they did also generate some stuff in the code behind of the view. If we go take a look, they just put a uh, handler here. There's a event that fires on the domain data source when a load operation is complete, which happens automatically when it parses the XAML. And if there's an error, you have to do some error handling with it. And so they just put the appropriate minimal error handling code in there in your code behind. You can see there's nothing here causing the load to happen. That happens automatically when this domain data source is parsed. 
uh, it will basically take care of, of firing that and you can see the auto load true flag up there causes it to go ahead and execute the query as that thing is, is uh, constructed. So with that in place, I can actually just F5 run this thing right now. It's going to fire up the browser. It's going to uh, load up the Silverlight app. That domain data source is going to execute the query, uh, making a service call to the back end, and then getting back the entities and populating the data grid here. Now you might have noticed, depending on the, uh, the latency of the webcast there, you might have noticed a little hesitation where when the, the Silverlight app first fired up, the data grid was there with the headers and stuff, but nothing was in the grid. And then a moment later, all the rows popped in. That's because like any kind of service calls in Silverlight, all the service calls and all the communications you have with the back end has to be done asynchronously. So there's a nice consistent pattern uh, defined by WCF RIA services that makes it fairly easy to deal with that asynchronous calling pattern. And it basically has a uh, calling pattern where you call a method such as load, submit changes, or invoke uh, type methods. And then there's a completed event that can fire that you can handle as an event handler, or you can pass a callback method to the uh, initial operation and it will call your method when the operation is complete. So you can see that was pretty easy uh, in terms of implement code implementation and stuff. And if you're just doing straight CRUD, it doesn't get a whole lot harder than that. You know, where the complexity comes in, especially for the retrieve side, um, there's not a whole lot more complexity to it. The place where more complexity starts to creep in, obviously, is where your business rules and stuff are implemented. And that's usually when you're changing data. So we'll get to that here uh, shortly in terms of the update side of things. The one thing I do want to show quickly before I do that is what if you wanted to do a model view view model type of pattern and still use RIA services. In this case, I've got the app that is part of my, uh, my article series with the Silverlight Show. It's just a simple task manager type application and it shows some tasks being loaded up here in a data grid with some other uh, filtering functionality at the top and, and ability to add tasks and save changes and stuff. Um, in this case, instead of having that domain data source in the XAML, the XAML itself is uh, just a clean MVVN type approach where it's just structural uh, information in the XAML. In this case, I happen to use the way of hooking my view model up to my view where I just statically declare it in the XAML to uh, hook it up to the data context. And then that view model itself is the thing that works with a domain, uh, domain context object to talk to the server side. So back inside of my view model, I have an instance of a domain context that I knew up. And then I mentioned that really what's happening uh, to get the data to the client side is that a load operation gets invoked. And this is one of those asynchronous operations. You basically pass that same object that gets returned from this get task query, uh, which is an expression tree itself. And then you can see actually down below a place where I'm uh, doing a separate load after I do a search by date, in this case, from the client's perspective. Again, I'm just getting the query that represents all tasks, uh, which is just a client-side expression tree at this point. And then I tack on some where clause here uh, to do some client-side filtering of what I want the server side to return. And then I just pass that query object to the load method again. That executes asynchronously. And when it's done executing, basically the entity collections <coughs> that are exposed by this domain context, this thing basically exposes that whatever entity collections are, are returned from the corresponding domain service. And so you can just dot down into this thing. In this case, it's a dot tasks collection. And uh, you can basically populate that task collection from the task collection that's exposed on the context object itself. So that's basically the query side of things, whether you want to do it programmatically with a load operation, possibly filtering, passing a filter criteria or other link operators to change what the result set's going to look like. Um, and you can do asynchronous handling of the completion of that, uh, which I don't have hooked up in the sample, um, but uh, I'll end up showing in a, a subsequent demo in a, a later webinar some of the async aspects of this. Let me jump back to the slides for a moment and just make sure we didn't miss any key concepts on the query side of things. So as far as query operations are concerned, the service methods or the methods in your domain service class that you expose can either just return a single object. If you do want something like get customer by customer ID, uh, you can just return a customer object in that case. 
you can return an I enumerable of T, but doing so means you'll have to load the whole collection into memory uh, in your service method, and then you have no opportunity to pass the filtering down to the database, like I mentioned. Uh, if you expose things as an I query ability and you have a link provider like Entity Framework under the covers, then that ex expression tree is actually passed all the way down to the link provider. And in the case of Entity Framework, that causes it to generate the right SQL statements so the filtering actually happens all the way down in the database through good efficient set operations. Uh, there are attributes for query, like I said, they're not required, uh, but you can put them there to do some of the extra things like a showed result limit to constrain the maximum number of items returned. Um, loading data on the client, you see how you use the domain context object, just call a load method on it. It goes, executes asynchronously, and populates the collection of data that's hanging off of the domain context uh, when that operation is complete. That collection does raise collection changed events, so you can just directly data bind to it, and the UI will update as soon as the data is available, which is why you saw that hesitation in the, uh, in the UI where it loaded the grid empty, and then the data popped in a moment later. And you saw the drag and drop data binding is available in, in 2010. Uh, whether you continue to use the domain data source that's generated by that or not, even when I'm doing MVVM, I'll do the drag and drop data uh, uh, stuff to generate the data grid and its columns or the individual fields if I do a details view. Uh, but then I'll go and strip out the domain data source and hook up my bindings to my uh, view model. All uh, right, I think I covered all this. Uh, the fact that you get the collection change, the load operation. Uh, down at the bottom, I, didn't, I, I talked about the async aspect. Basically, what the uh, load method returns is a load operation of T, where T is your entity type. And it's on the load operation of T that you have a completed event uh, that you can handle to know when it's completed. There's also, as I mentioned, another overload to the load method that takes a callback reference, which is basically an action of load operation of T. Um, iQueryable is, uh, I already talked about that in general, it's the thing that enables you to have this deferred execution, so I won't belabor that. And the one thing I didn't touch on is when you have relations. So if you've got something like customers and orders in the slide, or in my demo I was working with products that have suppliers, uh, the first thing, sometimes you may want to return the, basically a whole object graph, a parent and child and grandchild and so on down the, down the chain uh, when you retrieve some collection of root objects. And so to do that, you know, the first thing you'll have to do is make sure they get loaded into memory on the, on the server side. Within the framework, that requires either enabling eager loading, uh, or you can use the, the, uh, the include method that I show here to explicitly load child collections at the point where they're queried. Uh, there's a number of means to do that within the framework. And depending on what other data access technology you use, this may or may not be required at all. Uh, but the important thing to know that trips up a lot of people is that you need to have an include attribute on the related property on your uh, entity type. So let me jump back to the demo here real quick and show where this comes in. I mentioned this metadata class stuff down here uh, in the service project. If we drill into this, what we've got is looks like a redefinition of the product class and the supplier class uh, that are partial classes on top of the one that's generated by Entity Framework. And what these are here for is you can see that the uh, class itself has a metadata type attribute on it. And this is to basically add additional information about the properties of that type. And so you point to another type, which the convention here is to declare that type as a uh, sealed um, nested class. And on that nested class, then you redefine all the properties that your other type has. Now, you don't have to redefine all of them. Really, you only have to define the ones you want to modify. But what I was referring to in terms of the, uh, the include stuff is you can see here I have a related class called a supplier here for my product. If I want that to actually be serialized over to the client when it gets back products, I first have to load them in memory like the slide was referring to. But then for them to cross the uh, service boundary and get sent to the client, I'll need to put an include attribute on this property. And that's basically a signal to RIA services that says, yes, I do want to include this related type whenever I serialize the product over to the client. I want it to carry along its related supplier object. 
and uh, then you know the supplier could have related types for products. If I was going to go query supplier objects and wanted to get back the products collection for that supplier, I would likewise do an include attribute uh, down here on this guy as well. So that's what the slides are referring to there with the include attribute. Okay, what about the update side? Um, basically on the update side you saw already that there are insert, update, and delete methods that are defined on your domain service. From a service calls perspective what actually happens is on the client side you retrieve a bunch of entities or you may just start creating entities from scratch uh, through add operations on the collection exposed by the domain context. All those changes are tracked by an entity container that's held inside of the uh, domain context. And then at the point where you want to send those changes to the server side, you just call submit changes. Uh, basically, that, that whole bundle of changes is sent as a single service call to the server side. And then basically it starts iterating over each one of the items in the, in the change collection. It's called a chain set. Iterates over each entity and calls the appropriate insert update or delete method um, on your domain service and we'll look at code for this in just a moment. There are some naming conventions uh, that it, RIA Services uses to identify what is a insert versus update versus delete method, and you can see here the different uh, supported naming conventions with insert adds or creates, update modifies or changes, and so on. You can also be explicit if you want to use a different naming convention, then you uh, use insert, update, and delete attributes on the methods to indicate what kind of operation they are. And those methods are expected to just take a single parameter of the entity type that they work with. Uh, this just talks about the MVVM aspects, which I already touched on. So let me go show the code for the update side of things. Um, I'll use this already put together MVVM version uh, to demonstrate this. You saw when I ran this that there is the uh, capability there for me to modify one of the entries. Uh, once they get populated here, I'll just tack on a create project X here and say uh, save changes. And at the point where I do save changes, it's actually invoking a command into my view model in this case, but you could certainly do it from the code behind of the view as well. And uh, I should mention that the domain data source also supports doing updates. It's basically invoking an asynchronous operation called submit changes. That causes a server call bundling up those changes, does the whole process I just described of iterating, executing each one of the appropriate insert, insert, update, and delete methods. And then at the end of that process, realize that the changes on the server side could have generated new data, such as a uh, for additions, you might generate your IDs down at the database level uh, with an auto-numbered in, uh, integer column or something like that. Uh, you might have computed columns that are determined by the server side. So anytime you send a batch of entities down for update through submit changes, any of those changed entities actually also come back from the call in the form of a change set, and RIA Services takes care of merging those back in to the collection that's being maintained by your domain context, so that basically your domain context always tries to stay, you know, with a, a mirror image of what the server knows about the, uh, the entities that you're working with, which is very handy. What the code looks like for this, uh, as I've mentioned, this is using MVVM, and you can see some commands here. So a command gets dispatched uh, down into my, my uh, view model here for the save changes. And then on save changes is the method it targets. And you can see that basically all it does is it takes the domain context object and calls submit changes on it. It doesn't have to pass any parameters or do anything because the context already knows about all the entities it's managing and it knows which ones have changed by monitoring property change and collection change events on those objects. So it figures out which objects to send back down to the server. It also sends not only the current version, but the original version of the object so that you can do optimistic concurrency and you can also do more intelligent updates where if you've got an object with, say, 50 properties on it and only one of those properties have changed, uh, you could write the right code to cause it to only send the one property change to the database in the form of an update instead of all properties. Unfortunately, by default, the link to entities uh, domain service base class does not do that. It always sends all properties on the object uh, down to the database for update even if they haven't changed. So that's one optimization some people take is to step away from the linked entities uh, domain service base class, which is this guy over here that I showed before. Uh, the base class when you use entity framework in your domain service. 
some people step away from using that for efficiency purposes if they do lots of updates with one or two properties at a time and they don't want to pay the cost of sending all properties down to the databases updates, uh, especially if they have complicated triggers and stuff from a legacy database going on uh, down at the database level. Okay, and so once that submit changes happens, then I'm sorry, back into the domain service. Like I said, the set of changes gets bundled up. What you see by default is you don't see the set of changes. You just declare a set of insert, update, and delete methods, and you can see the signature of each one of these is a void return type and takes in whatever entity type you're dealing with. And so it will just basically loop over the set of changed entities, call the appropriate method based on what kind of change there was, and leave it up to you to do whatever is appropriate. Uh, the default code it generates here just uses the right patterns within the framework to persist those changes, but this is where you would insert any business logic if you were going to, you know, check the, check the values, compute some values, invoke some sub subsidiary tasks, uh, and so on. You can do all that through these insert, update, and delete methods. And if you really need to see things at the set level, you can just do an override of the uh, on submit, or just the, I'm sorry, the submit method. Get back here override the submit method, and you can see that takes in a change set, which is really the bundle that comes down from the client side with all the changes in it. So you can get into the process earlier on if you want to deal with things at the change set level. So that's basically all there is on the update side. Now, obviously, another big part of updating is validating, and I'll talk about that in the uh, next web webinar that I'll be doing uh, in about a month's time. So in summary, um, RIA services, you can see, very easy to use, powerful mechanism, uh, especially if you don't want to spend a lot of time on low-level plumbing just to push and pull a bunch of entities from a back end. It does have, as you'll see more in the next one, some very rich uh, validation mechanisms for that update process. You've got that benefit of deferred execution of queries, so you don't have to define a bunch of separate query methods. Um, and it's got good security mechanisms we'll look at in another webinar. Uh, there's a whole lot more to it than what I've had time to show in just this one webinar. So with that, I will go ahead and take questions. Let me bring the control panel back up here, and if, uh, if email could forward any questions that pop in, I'll do my best to answer them here uh, via voice. And like you said, if we don't get to your question, we will try to follow up by email. There's already one question. I think you should okay. be seeing it. Okay. Oh, yeah, I am just uh, forgot to expand the panel here. All right. Um, okay, so the question is, if I need to use another database other than SQL, such as Oracle, is there any tool for building your entities? Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's probably somebody out there that's built a tool. There's no official tools that I'm aware of. Uh, for creating your entities. As soon as you use what's called a POCO domain service, meaning you're going to use your own entity types and uh, they're not going to be entity framework ones, then it, you're kind of on your own. And I'm, I, I'll try to uh, plan on doing a separate webinar on that because there's a whole lot of other considerations that come in when you do POCO domain services. But if you were going to use a different database such as Oracle or MySQL or something like that, you would just be writing you know, whatever traditional data access you would normally do to, to pull your entities in. Uh, your entities themselves are just, like I said, plain old CLR objects, just properties with a few extra attributes, such as a key and association attributes on there. Um, and uh, the main place that it gets a little bit more complex is with all the change set, uh, change detection type stuff. You either have to go with just a last in wins type update scenario and slam them to the database. Uh, or you have to get a little bit more complex with the way you manage those entities. So it sort of becomes a, a fairly deep topic fairly quick that uh, we'll have to address at a later date. Um, next question is, what process am I using to keep my uh, domain service in sync with the EDML or the, the, uh, the changes to my entity framework? You don't actually have to do anything in the domain service itself because it's using the uh, entity framework entities directly. So any changes you make there are, are immediately reflected. If you're directly accessing properties on those entities within the domain service, then obviously uh, type checking and, and compile time type safety will help you out there if you like remove a property or something like that. Uh, but if you just remove a property and you're not directly accessing it in your domain service, then when you do your 
compile, it's going to recode generate the client side every time you compile. And so the, the client side would see a, uh, a compile error if it was trying to use a property that was removed or something like that. Uh, next question, can you show add task functionality in my MVVM application? Uh, sure, I'll just show that real quickly. Let me just go back to my task manager app here and go to the view model side of things. Again, it's invoked from a, uh, from a command in the view model. Now I'm doing a nasty, evil little thing here from a view model perspective. I'm effectively popping a dialog directly from my view model, which is a bad thing to do in MVVM space. Uh, but I did it just to keep the demo short and concise and on topic. But basically you can see here that all I'm doing is I new up one of my entity types. Um, and later on here, right in this line of code, I just do a dot add on my task collection on my uh, domain context. At that point, the domain context becomes aware of that entity, uh, adds it to its change tracking, and when I do a submit changes, that's going to be sent down in the batch as well as any other updates and deletes. Okay, uh, let's see, next question. Can you repeat in fast steps how I created my sample? Sure, so the basic steps, uh, I believe it, that's referring to the very first sample there, was create a Silverlight project, add a entity framework uh, model to your project to get some data into it, then add a domain service class as the uh, project template type in the web category to define a domain service and pick the entity types from my entity framework model that I want. And once I have that compile, it's going to generate the insert, update, delete, and query methods for me. And then on the client side, <coughs> basically drag and drop the entities from the, uh, from the data sources window onto a UI to generate some data bound UI. And it'll have one of those domain data sources and it will query the domain service for me. Uh, some tips on debugging with RIA services. Well, uh, that's another question there, and I have a whole article on that in my article series. If you check out, uh, in fact, let me bring up as a summary slide here. Check out the link here on the screen um, in terms of some reference material on this. It is part eight in that series that talks about debugging RIA services. Uh, some of the key tips and tricks are any of those async operations I was showing where I wasn't doing any kind of completion handling, always do completion handling uh, because you will get back error information in those uh, completed events or in the callback that you hook up and you can inspect what went wrong there. That's the first thing. Using a tool like uh, Fiddler is also a very helpful thing to be able to inspect the packets that are going on at the wire level. Um, and there's some tracing that WCF provides that you can turn on as well to see very low level uh, detailed information about the messages flowing back and forth. Uh, beyond that, I'd say check out part eight of my series on debugging. Uh, the next question is the include uh, attribute in the metadata file, is it the same as the include in the domain service query? Uh, it's the same basic effect, but basically instructing different things. <coughs> the dot include call against the entity framework object context is basically telling Entity Framework to load those child objects as well into memory on the server side. The include attribute on a metadata class is instructing RIA services to serialize those child objects to the client. So it's two different phases of life, if you will, for those child objects. The first include against object context is Entity Framework loading it. The second include on the metadata file is RIA services transmitting it to the client. Uh, question, does any model work with SQL 2005? Absolutely, any framework will work just fine with, uh, I think it's databases back to 2000, uh, possibly even SQL 7, but I'd have to check that. Uh, question, is domain service class only available in the online templates? Uh, no, the, once you have the Silverlight tools for Visual Studio 2010 installed, you should see a domain service class in the web category when you're in the Silverlight project. Uh, you shouldn't have to go to online templates for that. Uh, but you do have to have the Silverlight tools installed. Question, where is WCF coming into the picture here? <laughs> That's a very good question. The name is somewhat misleading because kind of as I mentioned up front, part of the whole point of WCF RIA services is to make it so you can be completely ignorant about WCF. 
Um, it's just that they are using WCF under the covers as the way that they communicate between the client and the server. Um, but it makes it so that they, as I mentioned, sort of uh, create a data pipeline for you using WCF so that you don't have to focus on any of that plumbing. You just focus on the server-side logic and entities and you get client-side entities and a uh, domain context object that does the communication with the server. Uh, another question here that says in the MVVM sample, uh, notice the non-search by date is clearing the domain context object and then getting the latest list and filtering. Um, they're questioning why I'm doing this. Uh, basically, there's only one collection on the domain context. So every time you do a query operation, if each one of those query operations returns a different set of entities of a given type, they're all going to be building up within whatever. So in my sample, I had a task collection. You know, if I do one query that says get all the tasks that start with A, and then I say get all the tasks that start with B and C and so on, those are all going to be accumulating in my domain context collection on the on the client side. And so if I you know want to present those by just data binding to that collection, then uh, you know, if I want to do it by by paging ABC, that's not going to work for me, and I'll actually have to clear out the domain context collection if I'm binding directly to it. Obviously, the alternative there is maintain a separate collection inside the view model and just pull the relevant objects out of the domain context collection. It really depends on what kind of update scenarios you're doing, whether you would want to do uh, one or the other of those. Uh, question, next question is, uh, how do store procedures fit into the picture? Really, as far as uh, RIA services is concerned, it, it doesn't know or care. It's really up to your data access strategy. Now, if you're using Entity Framework, uh, you can certainly use stored procedures. There are some constraints on how you structure those stored procedures to make them work nicely with Entity Framework. But if that's the way you're doing your CRUD operations under the covers of Entity Framework or whatever data access strategy you use, uh, RIA services could care less. The way I think about it is RIA services focuses on from the point where it's handed a populated entity on the server side, it will transmit that to the client. It will give the client a corresponding entity type definition that works nicely in the Silverlight data binding environment. And it will accept uh, changed entities back down from the client. And from there, it's kind of up to you. Now, as I mentioned, the linked entities domain service base class hooks up nicely to entity framework and makes it so there's very little to do in the domain service. But if you're going to use um, some other data access technology, you know, it's really at the, at the top level of the service boundary, sort of. You know, it's just talking on the server side about how do I get these entities to the client? How do I get them back? And then on the client side, a whole bunch of rich functionality. But other than that, RIA services doesn't really dictate anything. You want to use stored procs. You want to use straight table access. You want to use any framework. You want to use traditional ADO.net. It really doesn't care. It can handle any of those scenarios. Um, next question is, can you talk about using POCO? And if we use drag drop in the designer, um, we won't have the data sources. Uh, that's not entirely true. Uh, the, it depends on what you mean by POCO. But generally, when you talk POCO with domain services, it means you define the entity type on the, the uh, server side. And the client side entity is generated for you. And whenever it's a generated entity with RIA services, it should automatically show up in the data sources window. Um, whether it does or not, the data sources window can show you any kind of POCO, basically. You just have to go and say, add data source. Say you want an object type and point to that object type in the wizard. Um, so you should be able to bind to any kind of POCO, whether it's RIA services or not. It's just the RIA services generated uh, POCO-based objects should actually show up there automatically. Uh, best practices for line of business WCF RIA service apps needing SQL authentication on the back end and Windows authentication on the front end. Wow, that's a big question. Um, I think I'm going to have to defer that one to a future webcast. But if you would like to contact me offline, you can see my email uh, at the bottom of the slide here or via Twitter to start the conversation. Uh, I'd be happy to take that offline with you. Um, there's, uh, you know, uh, there's a good security story there. I, I'd also encourage you to first check out uh, part, uh, let's see, I think it's, believe, believe it's part seven of my series that talks about security. Um, check that out first and see how close that gets you to an answer and then contact me offline if you want to discuss it further. Uh, next question, does the generated code in the client side, uh, can it be located in the browser? Well, the generated code in the client side gets compiled and 
package it up as a DLL and as app, just like all the rest of your Silverlight code. So no, the, the raw code itself certainly is not visible um, in the browser. Certainly the contents of your Zap to a sophisticated user, they can crack that out uh, and see it. So you generally want to obfuscate your assemblies um, if you're worried about people seeing your code. But the raw code itself will never be visible in the browser because it's compiled into DLLs. Uh, next question, would you recommend using this hookup on SharePoint 2010 server object model on the server side? I am not a SharePoint guy, so it's very hard for me to say that, but I would generalize and say I would not generally try to mix RIA services with other kinds of um, service-based service technologies. It, as I mentioned, it's re really where it shines is when you treat it as a predefined data pipeline between a Silverlight client and a server side. You start trying to mix other client types and, and especially other service technologies in there and di different entity model type things like uh, what you're referring to there with SharePoint and things can get messy pretty quick. Um, so generally I, I would say no, but I don't know enough about exactly what the SharePoint server object model looks like to say whether that's absolutely a no. Uh, question, Silverlight local databases, what do I use? Uh, I use a lot of wishing and hoping that Microsoft would provide one. Uh, that's certainly something I've asked for a lot of times for future versions and I keep my fingers crossed that uh, we'll get some kind of a, a local database on Silverlight. There is a CodePlex, CodePlex project by a Silverlight MVP out there that uh, I am completely spacing the name of right now, um, but uh, I will, I'll try to um, if you contact me offline, I'll, I'll track that down and send you a link to it. It looks promising. It's very alpha stage at this point, so I'm not sure I would build something production on it. Uh, otherwise, what I use right now is just uh, XML or JSON serialization to isolated storage and don't really have a database, but wish I did. Uh, next question, an email. Uh, feel free to cut me off at any point here if we got to finish up, but I'll just keep, uh, keep answering as they flow in here. Uh, okay. Next question, what, uh, should we go ahead and wrap up or can we go no, just a couple just, minutes uh, more? Answer uh, all those questions and then we'll end. Okay. So uh, you got about four more listed here. Next one is what MVVM toolkit is best fit to work with RIA services? Okay, I have to say that I'm highly biased on this question because I was directly involved in the development of PRISM. Uh, which is a framework from Microsoft Patterns and Practices, really focused on building composite UI applications. Uh, but one of the things it, it focuses on in PRISM 4, the one we just released in November, is the MVVM pattern. So I would tend to use MVVM uh, PRISM as my starting point. There is a, another excellent one that has some overlap with PRISM that also has features that PRISM does not have in the realm of MVVM called MVVM Lite by a gentleman named Laurent Bunyan in uh, Switzerland, who's a, another Silverlight MVP, and that's a great uh, MVVM toolkit. There's also one called Calibern that's worth looking at as well, uh, and then there's probably a dozen others that I'm not naming, but those are the ones that pop to mind as my uh, primary ones, is Prism, MVVM Lite, and Calibern. Next question is specific to Prism and says uh, they use Prism and RIA services. Um, could I touch upon gluing them all together and updating the view with the view model in PRISM? From my perspective, uh, RIA services and PRISM are complementary um, in that PRISM kind of helps you with uh, the structure of putting together a view model and plugging views in. Really, RIA services is about getting data to the client and working with that data, and PRISM doesn't really know or care about that aspect. So I'd see it as sort of RIA sits almost underneath PRISM, and PRISM helps you load up functionality on the client side and present it in the, in the UI, and RIA helps you get data into the PRISM application to data bind to. Um, so I see them as sort of complementary, and, and how you glue them all together is something that's hard to do and just kind of words answering a question in a webcast like this, um, but but I think they fit nicely together, and the same could be said of, uh, of MVVM, MVVM Lite or other frameworks like that because they're really focused on just the structure of how you define your views and your view models, and RIA services provide you a means to get data into those view models to bind to. Uh, 
Uh, next question is for hierarch hierarchical grids. What is the best, best method for includes uh, client side or server side in the metadata? If you're going to have any kind of parent-child, like I was showing products and suppliers there, I didn't flesh out the full uh, sample of showing the suppliers, but I, I would generally you know, define the parent-child relationships as properties, uh, collection properties. So if it was the supplier has a collection of products or in the other direction, product has one supplier, uh, define those as just properties of the entity type on the, uh, on the objects themselves. And then in the uh, client side, there's not really anything to be done. It's really more server side defining the include uh, against your any framework model to get loaded and the include in the metadata to make sure it gets serialized to the client. Um, but the client side just has to figure out how it wants to present it and that generally is a matter of most parent-child type stuff I do in Silverlight. I leverage the uh, collection view source to chain those things together to have the parent, uh, parent and child uh, collection show up appropriately. I had a question here about can you explain the composition attribute and how does it relate to include? Okay, I go into a little bit of detail on that in, uh, I think it's part two or three of the series uh, on the Silverlight show there. But at a, in a nutshell, basically what composition is for is when you want to treat the child entities as fully contained or, or think of them as maybe implementation details of the parent entity. So in other words, if I was just going to go about working with products, and the fact that a product has a supplier, you know, I just treat that as kind of a subsidiary detail of the product. I never query suppliers on their own. Uh, then I can use the composition attribute. And what it, what it means at a code structure level is that you won't have a separate query method for those necessarily. Uh, and definitely on the update side, it will never send those, it will never go to call a separate update method or insert or update method for the, the composed children objects. Uh, so you put composition on the, the child objects or child object reference in the parent, and it basically says it's only going to call update on the parent, but that parent object is going to have a reference to the child, and it's up to the parent to figure out how to how to persist the child. So it, it kind of changes your uh, query patterns. And if you look at uh, some of the, the later ones, I forget it, I think it was maybe uh, part five or six in the series, I end up modifying the query patterns for the update of the task to include composition. So if you look at the source code in the part five or six time frame and look at the domain service and uh, look at the way it's doing the updates, you'll see how the composition affects the update process. All right, with that, I think I'm through all the questions I have listed here. I appreciate uh, people's attention and thank you for attending. And with that, I'll hand it back over to the email. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. There are probably at least 20 more questions, <laughs> but I think it's good to take them offline. So, okay, sounds good. Yeah, guys expect to uh, expect Brian to answer all the questions that are left by email within the next uh, few days. So thank you, I hope you enjoyed the webinar and probably uh, join the next uh, webinar by Brian. Uh, I think uh, they will be just uh, as in interesting as uh, this one. So thank you and See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.